The 1969 documentary, Mountain of Storms, was one of the most iconic adventure films ever made. Four men journeyed from California to Patagonia in search of good surf, fresh tracks, and new climbing routes. Among them was one of the men who would influence and inspire the next generation of fun hogs, businessmen, and conservationists, Doug Tompkins. Doug came by his obsession with the outdoors honestly, growing up skiing and kayaking. He eventually became competitive in both and dropped out of high school. At 21, he was frustrated with the poorly made outdoor gear available, so he took out a loan and started his own small business. The company was called The North Face, and that band playing the opening event was a little group called The Grateful Dead. And the bouncers were Hell's Angels. The world Doug lived in was full of free thinkers, poets, musicians. Things just seemed to coalesce. After being constantly bothered with gear suggestions and critiques at his favorite crags, Doug sold his stake in the North Face in 1968. And he hit the road. His six-month trip to Patagonia cemented Doug's legend status among the outdoor community. It also solidified his love for the wild, rugged, and remote landscapes of South America. The highlight of the film was the team's climb of the infamous Mount Fitzroy. Using skills honed on the granite cliffs of Yosemite, the team established the California Route, one of the most cutting-edge climbs of the era. During their 30-plus days on the mountain, Doug and fellow climber Yvonne Chouinard strategized about how to build their businesses. Yvonne went on to build Patagonia Incorporated, Doug returned to his two young daughters, Summer and Quincy. He invested in his wife Susie's small clothing company, which turned into a globally recognized fashion powerhouse, Esprit. The company's motto was, if it's not inspiring, it's not Esprit. By 1978, business was booming. Susie became design director and Doug the image director. He oversaw catalog layout and photo shoots and even designed the corporate headquarters. Esprit formed partnerships throughout Europe and China, growing at an astounding pace and eventually topping $1 billion in sales. But as the company grew, so did Doug's disdain for the fashion industry. He was spending five months a year climbing and kayaking all throughout the world and immersing himself in ecological literature. These trips made him increasingly aware of the disappearance of wild nature across the planet. The philosophy of deep ecology, with its central idea that all life on Earth, not just human life, has intrinsic worth, became the foundation for Doug's new worldview. In his last years at Esprit, Doug instituted a buy only what you need marketing campaign, asking customers to think twice before buying Esprit product, even printing it on their hang tags. Doug's disenchantment with consumer culture plateaued in 1989. He sold his shares of Esprit and ended his career in business. In 1990, Doug took his newfound wealth and moved to Chile. He purchased a farm in a remote area and began conservation work full-time. Over the next few years, Doug started the Foundation for Deep Ecology and the Conservation Land Trust. He also remarried to Patagonia's then-CEO, Chris McDivitt. She retired in 1993 and moved to Chile to become Doug's partner in conservation. We flew into this roadless area to this farm he'd just bought on this completely wild coast of southern Chile. No roads. Um, we lived in this tiny little converted smokehouse, and it was probably 100 square feet. It was the two of us. I mean, it was a great way, I think, to start a marriage of two highly opinionated and kind of strong personalities, because we were really dependent on one another for everything. And I think that's what forged this extraordinary marriage. In 1993, 
Doug and Chris began their first project in Chile, Pumaline. Here's nearly a million acres of pristine rainforest that's untouched and that the possibility of actually buying it, as audacious as that is, it was possible. And that's when we really began to understand that we were onto something much bigger than we ever imagined. And that was the first time, I think, that it really clicked. Oh my God, we can do this. But despite their intentions, Chileans became suspicious of their motives. At the beginning, in the early 90s, when Douglas and Chris came to Chile, and they said that they wanted to you know, create these protected areas to become national parks, people did not believe them. Chile is for exploitation, not for conservation. And this man, he wants to stop you know, the development in Chile and put a padlock on large pieces of land. And it was a huge controversy. They thought they had hidden intentions. We were famously called the couple who cut Chile in half. And they thought that Pumalín was being developed to create a new Jewish state, or it was the uh, new nuclear waste dump for the United States. Everywhere in the world, human nature, something new, something unknown, is met with skepticism. So I, I take it as uh, pretty normal. Skepticism plus. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it gets virulent. Well, let's look at some of the reasons that have been given. You, you are building a Jewish homeland. You are setting up a, a gold mine. You are a spy for Argentina. What's the craziest one you've heard? The craziest one was that we were going to take the local cows out and replace them with uh, North American bison. That was, the, that, was, that was about as good as it got. <laughs> the couple were polarizing figures in Chile. In addition to their land holdings, Doug had begun to support activist efforts on a local level, fighting industrial salmon farming, logging, and proposed dams in the area. He'd also gotten into the publishing business, printing large format books on a variety of environmental topics. He didn't mind to get in trouble politically, you know, to get, as we say, between the legs of the horses. You know. Douglas is amazing. I used to say to him, Doug, you've got to find a way to work with these people. It is their country, it is their culture, it is their political system, it is their faith. And what you're going to do for them is not just quite grand, it's very important. But they need to come to that conclusion, Doug, without you just forcing it on them. And thank God for Chris, because Chris was the one who could go in there after he'd blown through things and uh, the storm had scattered the landscape with his ideas and other things and kind of she'd put it back together and everybody would feel good about her. The idea that we were doing exactly what we said we were doing from the beginning um, really calmed the waters. Over the next several decades, Doug and Chris, along with their partners, worked together through their foundations to purchase land and create five national parks which were then gifted back to their countries of origin. Monte Leon National Park, home to 25 miles of pristine Argentinian coastline, colonies of penguins, and migrating southern right whales. Corcovado National Park in Chile, where emerald rivers meet the sea and the namesake volcano dominates the landscape. Yendagaya National Park, mountainous fjordlands in Chile's Tierra del Fuego region. El Rincón, a substantial addition to Perito Moreno National Park on the flanks of Chile's Cerro San Lorenzo, and El Impenetrable National Park in Argentina, strategically purchased to complete an essential wildlife corridor. Doug and Chris didn't just buy the land and turn it over. With every park, they endeavored to restore, rewild, and repopulate native species. They also made a careful effort to see that the human residents of these lands could continue their way of life, working and profiting off the land in a sustainable way. Just as he had at his spree, Doug involved himself in every level of each park's construction, from the architecture 
to the magnificent farms and organic gardens. His fingerprints were on everything. I think everything he did, he approached as an artist. I mean, every nail, every little piece of wood, every little development of any kind he got involved in, it was his eye. There was never any detail that was too small for him to examine. Douglas had this capacity to concentrate from the micro, micro level to the macro level. The fixture in the restroom, you know, the, the, the thing in the door, you know, he was into everything. Doug was really and absolutely always driven first and foremost by beauty. His identification with the folds and the grace and the beauty of landscape was just unparalleled. Doug also continued to get out and enjoy the places he helped to protect. Hiking, climbing, and kayaking with friends in these pristine places. The co-founder of the North Face Outdoor Clothing Company died Tuesday while kayaking in Chile. Co-founder of North Tompkins, Face, Douglas Tompkins, 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 died. Douglas Tompkins. On the day of the accident, I think he took the best of me with him, and I took the best of him, and I carry it with me wherever I go. Yes, he left me a lot to do and a lot of things to decide and push through, but the last thing I am is alone. You know, one of uh, Douglas' favorite concepts or ideas was um, Edward Abbey, you know, who said, sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul. Douglas saw very deep, you know, and acted accordingly. Doug, more than anyone else I knew, was a philosopher king of the environment, but also a man who was totally at ease in it and was energized by it. You know, it's very tempting to say Doug Tompkins was unique. There was no one else in the world like him. In this case, it has the added virtue of being true. He sailed against the winds and always reached his destination, however strong the winds may have been against him. It's not just that we're going to finish what Doug and I started. We're going to keep going. In addition to a multitude of planned projects, three more parks are in construction and slated for donation in the coming years. In total, Doug and Chris will have donated over two and a half million acres of land into the park systems of Chile and Argentina that will be leveraged to create over 10 million acres of parkland. There are movements suggesting that nature needs half. I think nature needs a lot more than half, but let's start with half. You can come and take a look and you can tread lightly there, but it has to be left alone. National parks have a lot of benefits. One is they get people out into nature. They disregard one's socioeconomic status. They represent a good form of, of social equity. They belong to everyone. It comes back to that idea that Dave Brower put in our heads about paying your rent for living on the planet. Personally, I can hear my biological clock ticking very loudly <laughs> in my ears. We have a, a lot of projects to, to do and, and to finish before we're finished. We'd like to say goodbye to the world having had a fundamental hand in creating national parks. That's our thing. We're gonna get this done. It's just a matter of time.